Good morning, everyone. Uh, hello, and welcome to this webinar with the Spain-US Chamber of Commerce and Osorio International uh, about the basics of business lawsuits in the US with an emphasis on concepts of jurisdiction. My name is Juan Carlos Pereira, and I am the Executive Director at the Spain-US Chamber of Commerce in Miami. And we are pleased to, to provide during these uh, last weeks uh, different webinars where we try to address interesting topics for our audience. So thank you so much for being with us today. It's a pleasure having all of you. Uh, today with us, we have Carlos Osorio. Uh, welcome, Carlos. How are you? Thank you very much. I'm good, Juan Carlos. Thank you for the invitation. So we have today Carlos, with is an expert and is an attorney based in Miami, Florida. He's a member of the Spanish Chamber of Commerce, and he's the founder of Osorio International in Brickell. Uh, he's a certificate uh, specialist in international law, uh, originally from Nicaragua. He's the former chair of the Florida Bar International Law Section, and Osorio International has a team of multilingual attorneys, including a Spanish lawyer. Uh, ready to assist in disputes, immigration, corporate, tax, and state matters. Uh, with 20 years of experience representing international clients in businesses, shareholders, intellectual property, banking, inheritance, and fraud cases in Miami and other parts of the United States, in both courts and arbitration. His clients are from all over the world, from Spain, Europe, and from Mexico to Chile and the Caribbean. He's trilingual, he speaks Spanish, English, and Portuguese, and regularly represents clients in their language. His typical client is a high net worth individual, families, international businesses, and entrepreneurs, mostly foreigners. Uh, so it's, it's a privilege having Carlos today to discuss about lawsuits, which is something very frightening for the foreigners. Um, um, every business that comes to the US uh, they are afraid of being sued, and, and also the individual people, the, the regular people on their daily lives are also afraid of sue. So I think this is an, this is an important matter uh, that we will address today. Um, before starting uh, and leaving Carlos uh, to, to go and dive deep in, this, uh, in these things, I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about housekeeping and how it's going to work. The webinar. So, as usual, um, the presentation will last around uh, 40 minutes, more or less. And after that, we will have uh, some 20 minutes for question and answers. Um, so, if anyone have any question during the webinar, they are welcome to send us those questions through the control panel that you could find on your right on your right side of the screen. You will see a control panel, and, and there it's um, a tab that says questions. If you click there, it would open a box, and you could write there any question that you might have, and we will address all the questions at the end of the presentation. And you could send those questions during the, the webinar, during the presentation. Um, also, this webinar is being recorded, and we will share with the attendees the video so that you could share with friends and, 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 and see it again if you would like to watch it again. Also, the presentation by Carlos Osorio will be shared in that follow-up email that we will send a few hours after the webinar so that you could have, you will have the video, the presentation, and also Carlos' contact information. So that is there any other question that you would like to address to him directly? You are welcome to do so. Um, so, last thing, before uh, starting this webinar, uh, we would like to ask uh, the attendees, all of you, um, a question that might help Carlos to address what we are going to talk today. We're going to send a, a, a small poll, it's going to be a, a quick poll. We're going to send a question for all of you and, and you could answer. So, have your company, have you or your company been sued? in the US, please uh, click there and, and and answer the question. So that way we would get a sense of uh, if anybody from the audience have been sued or not in the US. And that would help 
with the presentation. So if, if you would like to, to answer, you just need to click yes or click no. Okay, so I see people are voting. We're gonna leave it uh, open for another minute or so, so that everyone could vote. All right, perfect, ready, uh, okay. So we have the answer, 65% uh, of people, let's see here the percentage. So it seems that nobody here in the audience have been sued, so that's a good thing, that's a great thing. So let's keep it that way and let's follow Carlos' advices to keep it that way, so that's great. <laughs> Um, and we have here another question. Let me check if I can see it. Yes, this question is a technical one. It's just to under, to know if the audience speaks Spanish. So let's launch it. Do you speak Spanish? Uh, because during the presentation, uh, maybe uh, Carlos will use some words in Spanish, things like that, just to to gather the information of the audience and understand uh, the majority of you. Okay, there are some people remaining that they need to vote. You can uh, click yes or no. All right, we're gonna close it in 10 seconds for the last people to vote. Okay, perfect. So here we have the results. So 90% yes, so there's a 6% that doesn't speak English. Okay, that's fine. Okay. This presentation is gonna be in English, um, but just in case they, Carlos need to use a, any term in Spanish, we know this results. Perfect, wonderful. Okay, so Carlos, all yours. Thank you so much for being with us today, and, and we'll talk later with the questions. I'll be in the background just receiving all the questions from the audience. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, and thank you to the camera for giving me this opportunity to discuss the uh, focus of my career, which has been international litigation and arbitration. And I'm glad that we did the poll to know what language abilities we have here, because in my career, I have focused on representing foreigners. And when you represent a foreigner, you cannot assume that they know our legal system Mm -hmm. that they have experience hiring lawyers, that they're experienced with receiving bills from lawyers, that they understand who has the burden of proof, how evidence is gathered, how mm -hmm. appeals work, etc. You can assume nothing. So um, my emphasis has been on representing Spanish-speaking clients and Portuguese-speaking clients. And I've uh, named the firm Internacional with a C to recognize that because that's how we spell it in Spanish and Portuguese. Now, the subject of international litigation and arbitration is extremely broad. Uh, Miami is a hub for international cases, New York as well. There are a lot of high quality international litigators and arbitrators in Miami. Uh, the topics that we're going to cover today, let's get this started. will range from, well, you've been sued in the United States, what do you do next? Should you defend, should you um, not defend, etc.? Then, you want to sue in the United States, what should you consider? Then we'll cover how jurisdiction works in the United States. The concept of jurisdiction is very different in the United States than in Latin America and Europe. Even the word jurisdiction gets broken down into pieces, different types of jurisdiction, and we will cover that. We'll cover the subject of arbitration, which it could itself have its own presentation, but it's very important if we're going to discuss international litigation that we discuss arbitration. Uh, discovery, what is discovery? Very American, very different from the process for obtaining evidence in Latin America and Europe. Levantamiento de pruebas is the best translation that I've encountered in my career. Uh, and it is very intrusive and can be expensive in the United States. Sometimes it's the most expensive part of a case. 
This is one of the reasons why people try to avoid being sued in the United States. We'll discuss damages, daños y perjuicios, and medidas cautelares and how they're dealt with here in the United States. Quite different from the civil law approach. We'll also discuss how cases end here. There's a very important concept called the trial. Trial does not really exist in other countries. It's very American. The best translation for trial, and there are, there's debate as to how to translate it, is un juicio o una audiencia final en presencia de un testigo y jurado. It's like a final battle with the judge, with the jury. We'll talk about settlement and how that works as well. So you've been sued in the United States. Now what? Well, how did you find out? Did a document reach your email inbox called a complaint? And when did it reach you? And when you look at the first page, what can you tell from it? Were you sued in federal court in the United States? Were you sued in a state court? What were you sued for? And when were you sued? All of this is very important. You should know how to decipher this basic information um, from the first page and contact the lawyer as soon as possible. In our country, it's quite complicated how the court systems are divided. We do not have a unitary court system where all courts follow one single hierarchy. We have 50 states and each of those states have their own court hierarchy ending in a Supreme Court of each state, the Supreme Court of Florida to the Supreme Court of Alaska, 50 Supreme Courts. But then there's also the federal system and they have jurisdiction over certain types of cases. In general, the jurisdiction of the federal courts is more limited. Um, they have fewer cases, fewer load of cases, but that doesn't mean that there are any less important. In fact, often the federal cases are more complex. You've been sued, but were you sued in court or in arbitration? That should be uh, something that you can tell immediately from the document. And how did you find out? Were you actually served? How were you notificado, emplazado? Because there you may be able to raise a challenge as to notification. And you may be able to ask for the dismissal of the lawsuit until you are properly notified. Even though you know of the case, the proper mechanism to serve you in Spain may not have been followed. What were you sued for? We have so many theories of litigation here in the United States. We have uh, suits for breach of contract. We have suits for fraud. We have, you know, the slip and fall, etc. We will be focusing on lawsuits involving businesses, which are usually incumplimientos contractuales. But if the lawsuit is not about the um, breach of a contract, it could also be for what we call a tort. Very important word. Best translation that exists is responsabilidad extracontractual. For example, an executive steals money from a company, the lawsuit would be for the concept of conversion or breach of fiduciary duty or um, civil theft. These are not breaches of contract. These are torts. These are responsabilidades extracontractuales. Damages here in the United States may be stated in the complaint, but sometimes they are not. The complaint is the initial document. You may be reading the document and you're wondering, well, what do they want? What am I being, how much do they want? We do not have to state the total amount in the document. We just have to state if the jurisdictional minimum has been met. That's why sometimes you'll see in a document that the litigation exceeds the amount of $15,000. Well, it doesn't mean that you're only being sued for $15,000. It means that the jurisdictional minimum has been met. How much could it cost to defend? Very, very important. What kind of lawyer are you going to need? And what kind of budget are you going to need? Often cases, as I said earlier on, are expensive because of this concept of discovery, el levantamiento de pruebas. Discovery permits the exploration of documents that are in your possession, that are not in the possession 
of the other side. Discovery permits a thing called depositions, which is a live interrogation of the other side. It can be very useful when you're the one who wants to interrogate the other side. A deposition is sometimes translated as una declaración jurada. Una deposición is the, uh, the literal term that I've heard, but it's quite unique to the United States. I, as the lawyer, can sit the other side, not the other lawyer, the other side, and interrogate them for eight hours with breaks, of course. Their lawyer can interrupt, can object, but I get an opportunity to explore how much they believe in their case, how much um, evidence they have, etc. Because of all these differences that exist between our systems, because of the time and money involved, because of the language issues. It's important that you in litigation have a lawyer who speaks your language, I suggest. I've received many cases from clients who have abandoned their lawyer because they simply cannot sufficiently communicate. They want to speak directly in Spanish or in Portuguese to make sure they're being understood. And in litigation, sometimes it's war and you need to have sufficient people representing you, a partner, an associate, a law clerk, enough staffing to keep up with the pace. So you need people, language, infrastructure, and as we'll discuss later, experience in court and knowing the judges and all of that in the international arena. Now, moving along, let's say you want to sue in the United States. Should you sue? in the United States. Well, this is the flip side of what we were discussing. Are you prepared to spend the amount of money that it may cost to sue? Yes, you could start a lawsuit and then quit, but I would recommend to a client, you don't get involved in a lawsuit unless you're willing to go through with it. Where would you sue? Who would you sue? The who question is complicated sometimes. Can you sue the individual? Can you sue the company, when is their personal responsibility? When is their corporate responsibility? As a general matter, if you have a contract with someone in the United States you and there's a breach, you sue the party who entered into the contract. And generally speaking, those are companies. That's why people uh, create companies. So you cannot sue the individual for the breach of the company as a basic concept of our law, which exists throughout the world. There are times, however, where the presence of a company will not protect the individual and you may sue the individual and the company. I'll give you an example. You are a shareholder in a small company. Your partner stole from the company. The fact that you're all part of a company doesn't protect the individual from being personally sued. I see these cases all the time. A partner of a company comes in and says, my partner has been stealing from me. Well, then I say that we can see, sue the individual. Then the question is, where do you sue the person? Well, that is a complicated question of jurisdiction that we will deal with in the next uh, topic. Now, what level of evidence do you need to start a lawsuit in the United States? Surprisingly, you just need what is called a good faith basis to sue. You don't need to have all of your facts and all of your evidence, unlike in the civil law system. Sometimes you have extremely little evidence in the case of a fraud, for example, back to the partner who stole. You know that money left. You know who would have taken it. You don't know exactly where it went. You don't know what it was used for. You have this basic information you have a good faith basis to sue the person who took it. Even though that person may have many defenses, you have enough of a basis to sue. So the answer to what level of evidence do you need to be able to start a suit? A good faith basis. And our courts are quite open. You don't have to have all the evidence. And uh, even though you may be sued and you think the case is ridiculous, I sometimes have to tell the client, the case is ridiculous, we'll win one day, but they are still able to get their foot in the door of the courthouse because you just need a good faith basis. What kind of lawyer do you need? 
And where should you look to hire a lawyer if you want to sue in the United States? Well, if you want to bring a business type lawsuit, you should get a commercial litigator. If, you, if you're looking to get divorced, obviously you'll need a family lawyer. They're specialists in that field and they usually just stick to that. How should you look to hire a lawyer? Um, personally, I think some of the best, uh, the best way to find a lawyer is to ask your lawyer in your country um, and they'll tap into their network and maybe they know someone immediately or maybe they tap into a network where they ask people and a person is recommended. Asking a banker is also very good. They often have many good recommendations as to lawyers, asking an accountant, asking allied professionals in the field. The issue of language, which we mentioned earlier, I personally, but I'm biased, of course, I think there's nothing more fundamental than a lawyer's skill and his ability to communicate with the client directly, not through intermediaries, not by putting the assistant on the phone to translate. One-on-one -on -one in the language of the client, ideally. Um, yes, I've had clients that uh, do not speak their language, but I always strive in some way to be able to make sure that they fully understand what's being discussed. In this country, it's quite common for a lawyer when you're hiring them and your decision to, to be defended or to sue, that they'll bill you by the hour. That's the traditional hourly rate approach that we have in the United States. It's quite common. Um, and it varies from city to city, the rate. New York and LA are not Miami. Miami is not St. Louis, Missouri. <laughs> St. Louis, Missouri is not um, uh, Juneau, Alaska. It varies immensely. And there's just traditional going rates. Um, here in Miami, if we hear over $1,000 an hour, it raises an eyebrow. If we hear $150 an hour, we say, that's cheap. Many Latin American countries, 150 an hour is expensive. So unfortunately, it's expensive here in the United States to hire lawyers. It depends on the city. We usually bill by the hour. Sometimes there's a flat fee approach in litigation that's not that common, except for maybe criminal defense. The lawyer will bill once. However, increasingly, it is possible to negotiate with a lawyer a flat fee for a uh, the payment of a portion of the case. Please represent me just at trial for X dollars. Please handle discovery for Y dollars. That is possible. It is a little difficult to negotiate with your lawyer, but it can be done. Contingent fee. Contingent fee is asked about all the time. And what is that? Honorario por contingencia, where the lawyer, in the when they are suing, will not be paid unless they win and unless they recover because you could win and then you collect nothing. Let's say the defendant is broke. If you win and you collect, then in some cases it's traditional for a lawyer in Florida to charge 33%, sometimes even up to 50. That's the maximum in some kinds of cases. Generally speaking, a lawyer will not prefer a contingent fee unless there's a lot at stake and the, per, the company being sued either has insurance coverage or they're a large corporation. That's just a, two general rules of thumb. What is the American rule? The American rule is the opposite of the, um, the English rule. That's why we call it the American rule. The American rule is each side pays their fees as a general rule. The British rule is the opposite. Each, or the English rule, the loser pays as a general rule. Now, I know that in the civil law country, each side, uh, the loser can pay as well. In America, because we have the American rule, you must assume that each side pays their fees unless you have a way to force the other side to pay. What are the main two ways? Contract, if the contract says the loser pays, then suddenly the American rule is gone, and we apply your way of doing things. The other way is if there's a statute, if there's a statute. So in discrimination cases, there can be a federal statute that says the loser pays. 
there the American rule has been done away with. But in general, everyone pays their own fees. How long can a lawsuit take? One and a half to three years at the first instance level. And what about appeals? Generally, you can always appeal uh, at the end of a case at least once to our intermediate courts of appeal. Interlocutory appeals are uncommon here. What is an interlocutory appeal? An appeal of the case before it's over. So let's say there's a ruling of the judge during the case, one of many rulings. Generally, you cannot appeal those rulings. You cannot do interlocutory appeals. There is a huge exception though, jurisdiction. If a judge grants or denies jurisdiction, those are generally appealable because it would be unfair to make the person wait till the end. So let's talk about jurisdiction. When we talk about jurisdiction in the United States, there are two halves of the concept of jurisdiction. There's what's called subject matter jurisdiction and personal jurisdiction. This is why US concepts of jurisdiction are so different from the European and Latin American concepts. We have two halves that have to be satisfied, subject and person. So the subject can be satisfied in the sense that, okay, the subject matter, let's say is family, a divorce, and this is the court that should hear this divorce because the family is here in Miami. That satisfies the subject matter. But you must also satisfy personal jurisdiction. There must be sufficient vinculos or connections between the person and the jurisdiction. So although the family case may be long here, the individual may not live here, may have no connection to Miami. And although it would seem that the divorce should go forward in Miami, or it should seem that the breach of the agreement should go forward in Miami courts, the defendant is not located here. And therefore, the defendant may have a way to fight jurisdiction. So now we get to the issue of, well, how does this question of personal jurisdiction work? Let's focus on that. Now that we've separated subject matter and personal, we're going to fo focus on personal jurisdiction. The concept of personal jurisdiction is pretty broad in the United States. U.S. courts can sue people that are not U.S. citizens and that are not U.S. residents. You can be sued in the United States if you've only been here once, but if you did something while you were here that caused a harm, like an auto accident, there could be jurisdiction. But the question is complex as to what is enough to be sued in the United States. We, it's complex because we do not have a simple code, civil code provision that answers the question directly. Now, this is partly due to our federal system. That means there's 50 uh, codes, state statutes that deal with the issue of jurisdiction. And then we have the concept of precedence, which doesn't exist as much, it does exist, but not as much in the civil law system. So because we split jurisdiction into the subject and the person, because there's no simple code provision that answers when there's personal jurisdiction, because we have this mix of states and federal, and we have precedents, the issue of whether there's jurisdiction over la persona can be complicated. So we discussed this word, this term, personal jurisdiction, jurisdicción sobre la persona o la, compañía, o la compañía. We'll also discuss this concept of forum non-convenience, for inconveniente. Personal jurisdiction. We said that if you're a foreigner, you can still be sued in this country. What are some examples and what are, what are some of the examples of when there's enough contact and when there is not enough contact? All right. Let's move to the right side of the presentation where it says, generally speaking, if you or your business have systemic contacts, again, 
that's a term that has been interpreted by the case law, the precedentes. Systemic contacts would mean you're here all the time, you, you're here six months out of the year, seven months out of the year, you have a business here that although you're a foreigner, you own it, um, you travel to Miami all the time to try to, to do business, um, you have to have systemic contacts, then there could be what is called general personal jurisdiction over you or your business. And if there is that level of contacts with Miami or New York or LA, then now you are fair game to be sued in the United States for various subject matters. If you're here enough, if practically speaking, you're a resident, if practically speaking, you're a citizen, that's systemic contacts. That's if you're here all the time or doing business here all the time. But what if you're not here all the time? What if it's more of you entered into an agreement with a company in Florida and you breached the agreement with the company in Florida? Or you are a shareholder in a company, you live in Spain and you're a shareholder in a Florida LLC and you have a partner uh, in Florida and your partner claims you stole from the company, from the company bank account in Miami. In those scenarios, although you are not systemically here, if you did a wrong in Florida, felt in Florida, you may have committed enough of a, uh, you may have enough vinculos to be sued here for a tort, responsabilidad extracontractual, or the breach of an agreement, incumplimiento de contrato. So if you're sued and your partner, in the company alleges that although you live in Spain, you stole from the Florida company, I can sue you in Florida, even though you live in Spain. That's their allegation. We would then have to study, well, what did you do? Did you contact the bank in Miami to withdraw the money? Did the money leave the Miami bank account and go to another bank account of yours in Miami? How Miami is this? How New York is this? Because if a judge hears those facts, the judge would conclude, not only is there subject matter jurisdiction because the company is Florida, there's personal jurisdiction over you because you withdrew money from Miami, you transferred it to Miami, et cetera. Now, people are, lawyers are creative and they try to sue people sometimes for things that have nothing to do with Florida, but the fact that you have, you in Spain have a bank account in Florida, they may say, ah, you have enough of a vinculo. Fortunately, the law protects you, generally speaking, that it, simply having a bank account in Miami is not enough. If you've done nothing wrong, simply having a bank account doesn't mean you're present here and there's personal jurisdiction. Likewise, simply having real estate is not enough. Likewise, simply being a U.S. citizen, let's say you're a U.S. citizen, but you don't have a home in Miami or Florida, that's not enough really depends on your connections to the state. This is why I said earlier that our concepts of jurisdiction are complicated by the federal system, because if you're sued in Florida, the question will be, what, and you're a foreigner, what are your connections to Florida? Simply coming to a conference, a banking conference, a, a advertising conference is not enough, but it depends, it's case specific. Now, let's say there is personal jurisdiction. You, you did move that money from the Florida bank account to another account in Miami. Okay, there's personal jurisdiction, but maybe we have another argument called forum non-convenience. Maybe there's only one guy in Florida, but everyone else is in Spain. Everyone else supposedly involved in this uh, responsabilidad extra contractual are in Spain, their witnesses in Spain, all the communications between the parties are in Spanish, Maybe there's so much more connection to this case with Spain than Miami that we could persuade a judge that the case should really be in Spain. Because otherwise, we'll have to have everything translated, we'll have to have people fly from Spain for, for the hearings, etc. And maybe this partner already sued you in Spain. Maybe there's already a case in another country. When there are cases in other countries, that's an argument to um, have the case 
proceed in that other country. So this concept of jurisdiction is complicated. I want you to have that as a takeaway. It's different from Latin America. It can be expensive. And that there's really no way to guarantee you'll never be sued here unless you never set foot here, unless you have nothing to do with Florida. If a client comes to me and says, I have nothing to do with Florida, I've never been to Florida, I have nothing there, I'm starting to feel very good that there's no jurisdiction. But even if there is jurisdiction, sometimes we can argue it's just you know, not the best place to litigate. Okay, moving along. Arbitration and mediation. Now these are generally called ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution. Uh, you can't talk about international litigation without talking about international arbitration and mediation. America is very pro-arbitration. If there is a clause in a dispute that says we will arbitrate, the judges take that seriously. In comparison to litigation, enforce arbitration. In comparison to litigation, they move faster and there's a lot less discovery. This issue of levantamiento de pruebas, it's maybe 30% of what litigation discovery would be. In my opinion, uh, arbitration is not necessarily cheaper. Um, it can be just a lot of work in a shorter amount of time. Sometimes people sue to stop lit arbitration. Now you have two cases. Miami is a very strong hub for international arbitration. We've got great centers for arbitration, the AAA, JAMS, etc., law firms. We have good arbitrators and we have great um, arbitration practitioners, uh, advocates. What is mediation? Mediation is uh, very common. It's a voluntary procedure where the parties sit down at a table or now in la época de COVID over video and negotiate in the presence of a neutral, usually a lawyer, it's confidential. The idea is to emerge with a settlement agreement signed by everyone. It's usually a whole day. You can do it multiple times. You can mediate once at the beginning of the case. Oh, we didn't settle. Let's try again. I find that it's very effective, not just to try to settle, but even to see what the other side, um, how serious the other side is. So arbitration is in the alternative to litigation, but mediation is something that can be done within a litigation process or within an arbitration process. Discovery or levantamiento de pruebas. We discussed this at the beginning of the presentation. Easiest way to explain what it is, is when a party starts their lawsuit, because you only need a good faith basis to start, you don't have to have all your evidence. You can ask the other side for evidence. You can ask them for document requests. Give me all documents you have regarding X. Notice you can ask it in terms of regarding X. You don't have to specifically identify a document. This is one of the problems of discovery these broad requests that many foreigners call fishing expeditions. Um, sometimes they are, and the judges try to stop them, but the parties, of course, try to make them as broad as possible. Um, depositions, we discussed that at the beginning, that's a live interrogation. It used to be that you do them in person, but now with COVID, it's quite common to just do a video deposition or a video mediation. And there's even video arbitrations. There are no video trials yet. The courts are trying to figure out how to do that. Sometimes the evidence is not located in the United States and you must go abroad. Now, there are treaties to get that done, the Hague um, Treaty on the Collection of Evidence, but there's also ways to do it by way of an exhorto or a letter rogatory. They're slow, they're difficult. And sometimes that's a reason for the court to not have jurisdiction if all the evidence is abroad. Discovery can be the most expensive and longest phase of a case. Six months, seven months, eight months. Most expensive part next to the trial. Now, often when a client, next slide, often when a client comes, they say, I want to sue a person and I want to freeze all their assets. That's how we do it in my country. By the way, we also start criminal proceedings. That is not how it's generally done in the United States. You don't have no easy way to freeze all assets. You can freeze a specific asset if you show the judge that you have the right evidence to freeze it. For example, something was stolen from you, you have title, 
you can get what is called, this is not on the slide, you can get a pre-judgment pre rid of replevin if an item was stolen from you, but you'll have to post a bond, you'll have, need a hearing, they're not easily given. So medidas cautelares, they are available, they're generally more difficult. The concept of damages in the United States, daños y perjuicios are quite different here. Often clients come to me and they say, not only was my business damaged by the breach of the agreement, you know, my, my name has been damaged, I've had pain and suffering, etc. Most of those concepts are not going to work. Here you can get maybe the lost profits, lucro cesante, but it cannot be speculative. You will need to prove what your track record of profits was and have a perito, an expert, um, give a solid analysis of potential future profits, which will require analyzing the market, analyzing your business, um, analyzing your, your personal uh, business development skills. Um, those are direct damages. The lost profits from a breach of a contract, for example. Consequential damages are harder to obtain, but they can be obtained. What is a consequential damage? If um, I sold you a truck to make deliveries and the truck was not good, the direct damages would be the value of a new truck. The consequential damages might be, well, I was not able to make certain deliveries um, and my business suffered. So that's a consequence of the breach, a little harder to prove. Liquidated damages are damages that are stated specifically in the contract for breach. They are available in the United States with a big asterisk. They are subject to challenge quite often. If they are considered penalty, a penalty, a punishment, they're not enforceable. But wait a minute, that's the purpose of a liquidated damage to penalize. Well, just be careful how it's written so it's not construed as a penalty. Punitive damages, generally not available in contractual or business scenarios, usually in the tort scenario, hard to get, and there's been a lot of tort reform that limits punitive damages. We discussed interim um, measures and medias cautelares, so we'll move along. How do cases end in the United States? when they're 1.5 to three years, not including appeals. An appeal could add a year. And if you go all the way to the US Supreme Court, which is extremely difficult, they take like 100 cases a year out of thousands. They have the choice to take a case. An appeal could add further years. So our cases generally progress according to a schedule established by the court. That is true in federal cases. That is true in some state cases. And the court could say, we're going to have a trial in a year. We're going to have a trial in a year and a half. Of course, delays occur along the way. The parties ask to extend the deadlines, and that's how you get to the three years. Um, but the courts don't want the case to be uh, pending forever. So a case could end with uh, a dismissal. One of the parties surrenders. They dismiss their case. A case could end with a settlement. That could happen at any time. A case could end with a summary judgment. What is a summary judgment? That's un juicio sumario sin audiencia final. That means, hey, we don't need a trial. Judge, here's all the evidence. You decide, judge, not a jury. Uh, most often, parties will try to get a summary judgment. So that can add a lot to the expense, too, to present all the evidence to the judge and fight the survival of the case. And the case can end with trial, obviously. Uh, that's the, the main event, the big event. Only about, the statistic varies, about 8% of cases, commercial business cases, go to trial because, well, uh, the parties settle or they get resolved with a summary judgment or they're dismissed. And why do parties settle? To avoid risk, to avoid the massive expense of a trial. Uh, now, how do cases generally get moved along? Well, there's the, the schedule that the court imposes, but really it's the lawyers who are setting hearings and uh, insisting that X, Y, or Z issue be decided. And generally those things are decided not by presenting uh, an argument and the judge just rules. Usually it's by asking for a hearing, going to court, making a case in person and the judge rules. 
not necessarily that moment, maybe later, but cases really progress by oral advocacy and having hearings. This is why having a good oral advocate is important. This is why knowing the identity of the judge is important, so you can craft your argument for the judge. And because the judge decides so many issues on the case, and because um, the ability of the lawyers can vary, it's difficult to predict an outcome in a case. So I hope uh, you've enjoyed the presentation. The uh, issue of international litigation is one that uh, can last uh, hours and hours and hours. It's not one that is generally taught in the law schools. It's one that you learn along the way by being in the right city with the right kind of clients, with the right kinds of disputes. Here in Miami, uh, we fortunately are blessed by having uh, clients from all over Latin America and Europe. So we're presented with a million and one different scenarios as to business disputes, torts, and there's cl their clients are from all over Latin America. So I've had the pleasure to work with clients from all these different countries and their language. Um, that's it for the presentation portion. We can switch to questions now. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you. I have to tell you, it's been a pleasure hearing you. Um, you've talked about very interesting topics that uh, come up all the time with foreign companies that, that come to the Spanish Chamber of Commerce to, to start their businesses here. Uh, and you touched those key points and you did it in an extremely uh, transparent and clear way. So thank you so much for that great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Carlos. You. And I hope that we, we will be able to have you again in the future um, to talk about this because I think it's an interesting topic. So um, yes, as, as we mentioned at the beginning, uh, we are open for questions. We, we have already received some questions, but um, if you want to add also some questions, please send us the question through the dashboard that you will be able to find in your right side of the control panel where it says questions, and we will be more than happy to address all of them. And if we don't have enough time, uh, Carlos will take care of those questions and he will send us the answer, written answers, and we will share those answers with all the attendees. So, um, so first question that we have, and I think that you talk a little bit about this during the presentation, but it would be great to clarify a little bit more. So do foreign people have protection from a lawsuit if their single member LLC, which is organized in Florida, is sued? There's no special protection um, in the statutes, in the LLC Act, or in any other concept of the law to protect the person um, if they're in that sort of arrangement, there's sort of immunity. However, um, I presume from the question that what happened in this in the in the scenario that's being painted is an llc was sued now if the llc is the one sued and there's responsibility at the llc level it stops there then the individual should not be sued let's do an example let's say an llc um, signed a real estate purchase and sale agreement it's the owner of real estate owner of an apartment going to sell to someone. The LLC is the seller. Let's say the LLC then does not go to closing and does not sell. The LLC is then sued in this hypothetical for a breach of an agreement. Who is the right party to sue? In this scenario, just the LLC, not the owners of the LLC. For To reach the level of the owners, you would have to show some wrong committed by the owner. Um, that was the, um, the, the example I was giving of perhaps two owners of an LLC and one sues the other for supposedly stealing money of the LLC. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, another question is, what is the difference between witnesses in common law and the civil law system? Excellent question. One of the main differences, and I'll... I'll, I'll put a spin on the question. Uh, a witness in the common law system 
can be interrogated by a lawyer before the final hearing. So if my client tells me, there is a person in Miami that has useful information for us, that, that person's a witness. Let's say I call that witness, they refuse to speak to me. They just don't wanna to speak to me. I can do what is called a subpoena. I didn't mention that in the slide. Subpoena is a type of discovery. Subpoena, what is a subpoena? It is a order to a non-party, non-party, a, a person disinterested in the case sometimes to answer questions or to give documents. So a difference between our system and the civil law system is the subpoena. I can subpoena a witness to come to my office on a certain day, if everything goes smoothly, they show up, they are interrogated, they give me documents. That's one difference. Another one is at trial. At trial, the party, the lawyers, can ask questions directly to the witness. In the civil law system, I understand that the judge asks the questions. That's another big difference. I think another difference is this, and I, I, I think I know where the question comes from. In our system, in the American system, um, we do place a lot of value on documentary evidence. We do. But we also place a lot of value on testimonial evidence of a witness. And we're, we are more generous in allowing people to testify. So in some countries, um, the parties are not allowed to testify because they're obviously biased. They cannot speak. In our country, you can testify if you're a party. Of course you can. Witnesses can testify. So we place value on witness testimony, but there is a powerful weapon against witness testimony called the cross-examination. Cross-examination is when the opposing lawyer then asks questions to the witness to try to get them to look like a liar, inconsistent, that, they with, that they're biased, to get them to admit things that are useful. So witnesses have a, there's a different approach, let's say, to how we get to witnesses, and there's more value to oral testimony. Thank you, thank you, very interesting. And yes, we saw that that you were talking about in the media with other types of, of trials, very, you know, very, very known, not business trials, but uh, in many cases where uh, the the witnesses are real important, more important, I think, that in, in, in Spain, for example. Um, yeah. Another question that we have is, what is the difference between a hearing in international arbitration and a regular suit? Right. So in arbitration, generally, at least the way it, it's been done so far, um, you don't need anyone face to face until the final hearing, the big event. You have telephonic hearings, video, but no one is in the same room until that final hearing. The final hearing generally is allowed to occur. There's a pro final hearing bias. The, the arbitrators don't want to end the case before the final hearing. The final hearing can be a day, a few days, there's no jury, there's no witnesses, other than maybe just a few and, and, uh, and their testimony is kept short. Now, in court, in litigation, hearings happen all the time. They happen all the time. You could have a hearing just to have a status discussion with the judge, and that's in person, at least until COVID. You can have a hearing because the other side hasn't given you a document. You can have a hearing, a hearing, a hearing, a hearing, a hearing, and then the last great hearing is called the trial. And the trial is a day, a week, five weeks, and it's all done very formally in, the, in a courtroom as opposed to an arbitration, which can be done in a lawyer's office, in a conference, conference room. Uh, so there's a degree of more much more informality in the arbitration proceeding and there's really only one time that you all sit in person in the arbitration the final hearing whereas in court you're going and standing in front of the judge with the robe all the time okay great i believe that those numbers of hearings in the trials 
could delay the process a lot, no? Oh, yes. Um, so an arbitration, by comparison, try to get resolved in six months, nine months, a year. One year arbitration is pretty long. One year litigation is fast. And one of the main reasons, actually, the main reason litigation is slow is because the parties want it to be slow. No one is setting hearings. No one is going to court. There's sort of an unspoken speed to which the case is being taken. Neither side is pushing the case. Now, uh -huh. the other reason is everything's being fought. Everything requires a hearing. You ask the other side to give you a piece of evidence. They say, no, I will not. Then we have to have a hearing on it. And guess what? We got to wait a month for the hearing. There's delay. Then you have the hearing and maybe the judge says, okay, I will issue my order shortly. Another two weeks go by. Let's say you want to set a hearing, but no one's available. You know, there's a lot of games that get played. So yes, litigation is, is, slow, is slower than arbitration because of cool. hearings quite often. Thank you. Um, how will uh, a damage award be enforced in a country where those damages are not allowed? Like for example, a Spanish company in an arbitration proceeding in Miami. I see. Um, well, let's look at it from both sides. Um, let's say there is a uh, arbitral award that is being brought to Florida or an arbitral award from Florida being taken to another country. Um, there is a treaty, the New York Convention, on the recognition of arbitral awards. There's also the Inter-American Convention. Um, the bases to challenge an award are very limited, very, very limited. They usually deal with questions of due process. Um, the if the damage is not allowed in another country, then you would have to come up with a order public type of argument that it offends public policy. And you would have to raise that issue in your courts. So my Florida arbitral award that has, let's say, some damage that is you know, offensive to Spanish public policy or order public, you would have to mount that challenge in Spain under Spanish law to try to prevent the enforcement of that award. Similarly, if uh, we have an award from Spain that's brought over here, and let's say there's some element that's offensive to US public policy, I would try to raise that as a defense. I'll give you a clear example, not involving Spain, but Latin America. If you're sued for defamation, in some Latin American countries, believe it or not, truth is not a defense. It's just not. You just, what does that mean? That means don't say bad things about people, even if they're true. So if my client is sued in Ecuador, I'm not just to pick a country, and there's a $1 billion defamation judgment against my client, that then, uh, and in that defamation, uh, truth was not a defense, if then that judgment is brought to Florida to be homologado, and I'm the lawyer, let's say now I switch sides for some reason, I would say, you can't domesticate that. That's offensive to the First Amendment of the United States on free speech where truth is a defense. So that's one of the ways that a damage award, you could try to block it. There are, many way, there are other ways to challenge awards. It's difficult to challenge an award because it's presumed that you already had your day in court. You don't get to re-litigate. Okay, well, thank you. Um, what happened if your counterpart do not assist to court? Uh -huh. I think that this is getting to the issue of a default. So let's say I, my counterpart is in the Dominican Republic. Um, they breached an agreement in Florida. You know, I'm, I'm in Florida. My agreement is to perform something in Florida, and this is a person in the Dominican Republic who I notify with the suit. They go see their lawyer in the Dominican Republic. That lawyer in the Dominican Republic contacts a lawyer in Florida, and they have a frank discussion as to whether they should defend. Okay. 
assuming that he was the Dominican was properly served. If you have a good international litigator, the next question might be, do you have assets in Florida? Because if you don't, and if you have no intention to ever go to Florida, maybe you don't defend. It's risky to follow this, but this defense strategy, but if you don't defend, this is the answer to the question, then a default could be entered and a default judgment, an amount could be established by the court of the judgment. But that judgment would only be valid in Florida, not in the Dominican Republic. You would have to take that judgment to the Dominican Republic to try to enforce it. And guess what? Some countries in Latin America refuse to enforce default judgments. So the intelligent legal team decided, you know what? Our best defense is we'll do the turtle maneuver. We're not going to defend anything. We're just going to let them have fun and get their default judgment. And I'm going to stay here in my mansion in the Dominican Republic and they can't, they can't touch me. But if the individual has bank accounts in Miami in his name, that could be frozen. So if the individual refuses to go to court, the answer to the question is a default judgment might be able to be entered. And if you know of assets in Florida, you might be able to collect on them. And you may be able to give effect to your judgment in another country, but it won't be easy <laughs> or cheap. Okay, good to know. Interesting. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, we have another question that it's it's also something that people all often they ask themselves, people that don't live here in the US. So when yeah. will there be a jury in the US? Uh-huh. Um, now, we're talking civil cases because we have a difference between criminal and civil. In criminal, almost always, you have a right to a jury. In civil, there is a concept which you're going to laugh when you hear it. When do you have a right to a jury trial if you're the defendant or the plaintiff? Either side can demand a jury. You have the right if the following can be answered uh, yes. In the year 1776, did England permit juries on this issue? Why? <laughs> because the laws of the United States descend from England. And mm -hmm. so when, when that uh, independence was declared, most states in the United States said, okay, we don't have laws yet. We don't have like a Código Civil or Código Procedimiento. We hereby adopt the laws of England. So that's the base from 1776. And from that base, all laws in the United States started to evolve. Mm -hmm. So in most cases, the jury, the, uh, the right to a jury trial is answered by if in the year 1776 you had the right to a jury. Uh, the answer is yes in a breach of a contract. The answer is no in a family law case uh, or the or the legislature can prevent, can change the laws and say no right to a jury. So divorce cases do not go to juries. They're decided by judges. Breach of contract cases can be decided by a jury. It's something you need to ask your lawyer about. And if it's criminal, assume you can have a jury. If it's civil, don't assume it. You have to ask your lawyer to, do a little research. 1776, it was permitted. You have a right to a jury. Well, that, that's a great question for trivia. Huh? <laughs> it, is, it is. Thank you. Um, all right. We have, I think, here the last question uh, for today. It's um, how are arbitrators chosen? chosen? Uh, can they be struck? Yes, uh, they can be. So how are they selected? Uh, you must start with the contract. The contract uh, will have an arbitration, if the contract has an arbitration clause, um, it may or may not state how arbitrators are selected. Um, it's quite common for the arbitration clause to be, have been written at the end of a negotiation between parties. So you just slap on an arbitration clause, nobody negotiates it. It's just like a Lego block that's added to the contract. 
and nobody thought about the mechanism to select an arbitrator. So um, there may be nothing in the arbitration clause as to the selection of an arbitrator, in which case the parties in an arbitration would be free to agree on an arbitrator or the institution, the institution, the AAA, American Arbitration Association, for example, um, would have a mechanism to name an arbitrator if the parties are unable to agree. There would be one named, selected by the person, by the institution. The institution will encourage the parties to select someone. And if they cannot agree, it'll be imposed. Uh, the arbitration clause may say, I pick one, you pick one, they get together and pick a third. Very common. I pick one, you pick one, they get together, pick a third. That third is usually called the chair of the arbitration. What does the chair do? The chair um, is the person who sets hearing dates, um, keeps order in the hearings, keeps order to everything, uh, uh, insists on procedure being followed. Um, and so if I pick one and you pick one, they get together and select one. That's how the three were picked. Um, if I pick one, you pick one, and they cannot agree, then the institution will pick the third. Um, now, some, some clauses will say there will be three. There will be three. Nothing else. There will be three. And if we can't agree, then the institution will pick the three. Um, now, the institution has procedures. They may say, okay, here's a list. Tell us your preferences. Rank them. Now you rank them. Now that at least the association has a list of, of preferences and then they'll use a, a formula to try to take the ones that are of the highest preference for each. Um, challenges. When arbitrators are selected, they must give disclosures. Disclosures of any relation um, to the parties or the lawyers. Now, being friends is not a problem. Being former law partners is a problem. Um, having shares in one of the companies that's involved in the dispute is a problem. Competent, ethical arbitrators in those cases will recuse themselves, will voluntarily say, I'm honored by my selection, ladies and gentlemen, I hereby recuse myself. Sometimes that won't happen, or sometimes, quite honestly, an arbitrator may have forgotten of some link from years and years and years ago. 30 years ago, we were, I was, uh, law partners with this guy's law partner and it may be a reason for the other side to feel uncomfortable and uh, the person the arbitrator then recuses himself but if there's a refusal to recuse then um, there could be a formal challenge raised by a party as to the potential bias of the arbitrator not just the not just the bias it could be the appearance of impropriety uh, because you don't want close calls on on uh, on bias, you want clean. So if there's an appearance of uh, of bias or or there is an actual one, then the and if the arbitrator doesn't recuse him or herself, the institution could recuse the person. Um, in arbitration, it is quite common for there to be challenges, especially in high stakes arbitration. The arbitrator selection phase takes a while and it can get expensive as a result because, listen, there's no appeals from arbitration. This is it. The selection of the arbitrators, the identity is very important. The country of origin of the arbitrator sometimes is extremely important because that um, will, will um, tell you a lot about their legal training, how they see the world, how they believe litigation should be handled, the value of evidence. And so origin of the country of the arbitrator can be very important and people fight over that. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's been uh, very clear now to me how the process, so the, the thing is, just please, if you're going to sign a contract, set there the clause arbitration, how are you going to pick the, the, the arbitration? Right. 
that's that's a good thing well carlos um that was all for today thank you so much again for your excellent presentation i think it was really clear and and very interesting and productive um thank you thank you for sharing this with us and thank you to all the audience for being again with us in this webinar uh, i'm gonna share with you the website of the spanish chamber of commerce so that you could take a look to the next events that we have in place you can check that on events and follow us on the on the next uh, things that we are doing and i hope that we will be able to see each other again uh, again carlos thank you so much and Muchísimas Vicente. gracias a ti, Juan Carlos, y a la cámara. Un placer. So it's a pleasure, and remember, we will share Carlos' contact information, the video, and the presentation in a follow-up email today. Thank you. Goodbye.